Okay, so hello. As most of you know, my name is Arden Trewortha. I'm a community partner with the Colorado Trust, and I want to welcome you to the webinar CareerWise with Ashley Carter and Hollis Salway from CareerWise. This webinar is the second in a six-part rural development learning series, which will take place over the next two weeks. The series is sponsored by resident teams of the communities of Amplonito, Avondale, Dove Creek, Olathe, San Luis, and Sawatch, in partnership with the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center and the Colorado Trust. Each of these communities has a resident team who have committed literally thousands of volunteer hours over the last two years to identifying and analyzing their community's most pressing issues. They are developing community health equity plans to address these issues at the roots. Each resident team identified depressed economic conditions in their rural communities as a root cause issue, one that especially affects children and the non-college bound young people. Communities recognize that depressed economic conditions are connected to social disconnection and systems of discrimination that often play out along race and class lines. Residents know that building their power, especially the power of those most affected by the issues, to advocate for themselves and their community's future is an important part of any solution. These webinars were designed to connect resident teams to statewide experts working on the solutions to Colorado's rural economic development challenges and to inspire thinking and conversation at a local and regional level. Recordings of these webinars will be made available on the Colorado Trust website for later viewing. A number of resident teams also plan to invite community residents, local elected officials, and other partners to view and discuss these webinars together. The webinars will be interpreted and the material will be translated into Spanish in the upcoming weeks. So in terms of housekeeping, um, I'm going to review the structure for today's webinar. This webinar will be 90 minutes and will end at 4 o'clock today. During the presentation, video and audio will be disabled for all participants. If you are joining us via computer, you are welcome to type your questions into the Q&A link on the webinar um, screen during the presentation, and you should find that at the bottom of your screen. The presenters will see your questions and respond as they can. After the presenters have finished, as time allows, we will open the floor for dialogue, and all participants will have the option to join the conversation via phone or video. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Ashley and Hollis. Ashley Carter is the Chief Strategy Officer of CareerWise Colorado. Ashley previously served as the organization's Chief Operating Officer, bringing the organization's early vision to life as its first official employee. Ashley earned her BA from Harvard University and her MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business. As CareerWise continues to grow and expand, Ashley stepped into the Chief Strategy Officer role to help redefine or refine organizational strategy manage expansion initiatives, and develop and lead the organization's new national consulting efforts aimed at supporting other states and communities around the country to develop youth apprenticeship programs. Presenting this webinar with Ashley is Hollis. Hollis Salway is thrilled to join the team at CareerWise Colorado as the Director of Development. Prior to joining CareerWise, Hollis was the Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations at Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Denver where she led the organization in moving for or moving toward a more outcomes focused conversation with its funders and individual donors and where she helped the club's corporate supporters make tailored investments in Denver's youth. Hollis earned her BA from Harvard University. She believes strongly in the power of bringing together the private sector, nonprofit and public leaders to drive positive change in our communities. What we hope you will learn from this webinar is learn about the CareerWise Youth Apprenticeship Model, how it works, and its expected outcomes, and understand how CareerWise is expanding its work in Colorado through Community Readiness Framework and application to become a CareerWise Youth Apprenticeship Partner Community. And now, without further delay, let's begin the presentation. Ashley and Hollis, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for having us uh, here today. We're just so thrilled uh, to be a part of this webinar series and 
really honored to join you all here today to share more with you about something that Hollis and I are really excited about, uh, which is uh, helping to build a youth apprenticeship system here in the state uh, of Colorado. And we're really leading the nation uh, in this type of work as a state. Uh, and so it's very exciting uh, to get to be a part of this work. And uh, we're hopeful that some of you listening today uh, will in the future join us as part of this work. So we're eager to hear your questions uh, and get your input as we share more with you about our model. Um, so hopefully you all can uh, share, or hopefully you all can see these uh, materials, I should say. Uh, I'll just briefly go over our uh, planned agenda for this session and then turn it over to Hollis. Uh, so we're going to spend about a half an hour walking you through our CareerWise uh, Colorado model, you know, what it is we do, why we do it, uh, how we do it. Uh, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about our local leadership model, which is the mechanism by which uh, we're working to expand youth apprenticeships uh, in a statewide manner over the next decade. Uh, and then we'll also spend some time uh, getting into the detail uh, a little bit and helping you understand uh, how we work in partnership uh, with communities uh, to prepare them and ensure their readiness uh, to launch youth apprenticeship programs uh, in their communities. So uh, we should get through that in uh, at least a half an hour, an hour, sorry, uh, maybe a little less time. So we should have a uh, half an hour on the back end of this to hear your questions about CareerWise. Um, and to the extent you have thoughts or ideas about how this model may best fit in your community, uh, you know, we're certainly interested to get your input and hear your feedback as well. So please do share those thoughts with us uh, as you have them. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Hollis, who's gonna walk you through the CareerWise Colorado overview. Great, thank you so much, Ashley. All right, so um, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Hollis. I'm the Director of Development for CareerWise Colorado. So that means I have the very distinct pleasure of working with a, a group of funders, both here locally and nationally, um, that are supporting us through our launch and pilot phase, um, and hopefully working to cultivate the relationships that will allow us to grow youth apprenticeship across the state over the coming years. Um, so I do have a background in, in both fundraising and program management. So i um, just so excited, as was mentioned, to be a part of this team. Um, I'm particularly passionate about talent development and its intersection with the nonprofit sector. So how do we cultivate environments and opportunities um, that allow everyone to have access to, um, to reach their full potential? Um, so um, career-wise, as many of you I'm sure know from either perusing our website or, or doing a little Googling and reading, um, is a new nonprofit organization. We were formed fairly recently in 2016 with the very ambitious goal of launching, uh, building first and then launching a youth, uh, statewide youth apprenticeship system here in Colorado. So our work here is inspired by the youth apprenticeship system in Switzerland. Um, it's been incredibly successful for both companies and young people in that country. Um, and so all of this started a couple years ago when our founder, Noel Ginsberg, who himself is the CEO of a manufacturing company, um, rallied the business community here in Colorado to go to Switzerland along with the, the governor um, and leaders from education and workforce um, to see the model in action and to really uh, feel firsthand the impact that it might have um, in a community like Colorado's. So um, in the overview here, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about the model that we're building, why we chose it, um, and um, the processes and partnerships that we are putting in place to, to launch this system, um, and the impact that we hope it will have. And then I'll end and give a quick uh, snapshot of, of where we've landed in terms of launching this system and uh, where we're headed in the coming years. So um, so let's, let's jump right in. So why youth apprenticeship? Um, and, and perhaps more importantly, why a youth apprenticeship system that spans across the state um, and is supported by a robust ecosystem rather than just a program in, in isolated schools or communities. Um, we believe at CareerWise that when a true system is built across the state, the natural incentives that it offers to apprentices, to businesses, and to schools and educational institutions will help bridge um, what is currently a, a pretty large gap between education and the workforce. Um, and it will do so by aligning young people and companies around mutual benefits. 
So uh, those benefits are things like you can see listed here. They're concrete, measurable things um, that work on both sides. So on the apprentice side, they get debt-free college credit. They get an industry-recognized credential and three years of wages. And on the business side, they're recognizing a true bottom line financial return on the investment that they make in those wages and training for apprentices. Um, over time, as each partner reaps the benefits um, of a youth apprenticeship system, we believe that we'll create a virtuous cycle of a tighter, much more interdependent relationship between school and career. Um, and we believe that when we reduce that gap, not only can we foster greater productivity and innovation in the workforce, um, but very, very importantly, we believe that this engagement at the workplace will also inspire and enable higher levels of achievement and attainment in the classroom. Um, in other words, we truly believe that youth apprenticeship can drive key economic and educational outcomes that will make Colorado a national leader in redefining the education to employment life cycle. And in order to get there, we have to, we have to address some real problems. So um, we'll be a leader because we'll be addressing problems that have been plaguing us here in Colorado, but that are not dissimilar from problems faced in other areas across the country, um, in, in communities, big and small. Um, at CareerWise, we're a business-led organization. Um, so that means we are starting with real needs in the business community. Um, and to, uh, you know, this is, this is incredibly re relevant, especially for, for those of you on the, on the call here, because business is often the driver of the economic opportunity that we know supports health and well-being in communities. Um, and so when we look here in Colorado at the context that we're facing, um, you can see that businesses need skilled talent. Um, right now, it is costing Colorado businesses too much time and money and effort to find qualified candidates for good paying jobs. Um, and those good paying jobs are what are often referred to as middle skilled jobs, which you see here on this slide in the top blue box there. And the amazing thing about these middle skilled jobs and the reason that we believe that apprenticeship can be a powerful solution for addressing the skilled worker shortage is that to be qualified for most of these middle skilled jobs, you need more than a high school degree, um, but not necessarily a college degree. And so again, when we look at our situation here in Colorado, I'm sure many of you are, are intimately familiar with this, that's really important because there are a lot of people in Colorado who are not making it all the way through to a post-secondary degree. Um, if you look here, you can see that out of every 100 students who begin ninth grade, only 18 will actually graduate with that coveted degree um, and be able to secure gainful employment. And this is partly a result of the fact that for so long now, the only message that our students have been hearing is that college is the one key to success, um, the only door through which they have to go to, to make it to a successful life. Basically, that it's college or bust. So what message then are we sending to the 82% of young people who are currently going bust in our system? Alternatively, in Switzerland, students pursue a combination of classroom-based education and vocational training that allows them to move um, back and forth between the two over the course of their career. Um, and researchers and experts call this a permeable education system. Um, and basically, it increases choice and opportunity, and at no one point are they making a decision like the decision to attend college here in, in the United States does. Um, that shuts off or turns on subsequent opportunities. So choice remains open to them over the course of their lives. Um, this, in, in, as a result of that choice and opportunity, therefore, they have increased upward mobility too. As a result, Switzerland's economy on the whole has been ranked one of the most innovative in the world. Um, it enjoys low youth unemployment, high rates of educational completion, um, and that's in large part due to the fact that nearly half of the companies in that, in that country participate in and get a return on their participation in their youth apprenticeship system. So obviously, um, the mechanics of the system that we're building here in Colorado um, look and feel different than they do in Switzerland, because we are not Switzerland, we are Colorado, um, but we are striving to replicate the, the central incentive from the Swiss system, which is a measurable return on investment for the companies that employ youth apprentices. Um, so the data on this slide that you see here is from Swiss companies. Um, and what's really interesting to note here is that the apprenticeship period itself, so the period of time up until that dotted line on the graph, um, is, is it offers a positive return in and of itself, around 10% on average. Um, however, if you look at what happens after the apprenticeship, when companies convert an apprentice into a full-time employee, um, they actually continue to realize positive ROI. 
um, despite the fact that they're now paying the apprentice who turned into an employee significantly more than they were during the apprenticeship. Um, and that's because that's what they would have to pay um, a similar experienced worker, kind of, you know, a higher off the street, quote unquote. Um, but the apprentice comes with the knowledge of company specific culture um, and an understanding of uh, norms and, and uh, processes that makes them more productive right off the bat. So it is a lofty goal, but to build the system of youth apprenticeship here in Colorado, um, CareerWise is playing the role of a third party intermediary nonprofit organization. Um, and what we do in that role is we build relationships and partnerships with businesses, K-12 institutions, um, higher ed institutions. So um, at the K-12 level, that includes both district level partnerships and relationships with individual schools, including some charters. Um, and at the higher education level, that includes relationships with both community colleges and four-year institutions, um, as well as institutions like CSU Global, online schools, um, and some private providers as well. Um, we also act as a liaison with various state agencies um, that intersect with talent development in, in our state. So workforce, employment, economic development, education. Um, and as the intermediary, some of our key functions that we oversee on the CareerWise team include building quality frameworks for participation, helping orient our partners to new ways of relating to one another, um, and then actually creating materials and tools for our partners to use, um, including things like, uh, like actual formal agreements. So we are the ones who have created and brokered agreements between parties. Um, and then we also play a large role in actively recruiting both businesses and students to participate in the system. And then once the program is up and running, CareerWise continues to play a large role um, as we shift into implementation. So CareerWise uh, carries out functions like running initial training for participants, onboarding training for uh, companies, and what we call a, a boot camp professionalism training for participants or future apprentices. And then we act as a single point of contact between schools, businesses, apprentices, parents, um, and we help collect feedback on an ongoing basis for continuous improvement of the program. Um, over the longer term, we will, of course, continue to work with our state agency partners and advocate for policies at a state level that will allow for full and equal access to the system. So um, particularly on the education side, where that may entail rethinking how, you know, how we measure competencies for students and how they're evaluated and tracked um, and how students and schools are funded or how classroom credit is given for experiences like work-based learning. So what does it look like? Um, as it stands today, our youth apprenticeship model is one in which an apprentice splits their time beginning in his junior year between um, three distinct learning environments. So it goes between high school, um, his apprenticeship job, and, and what we're calling a training center, which is that community college or four-year institution um, where supplemental um, related instruction is given. Um, and so in year one, an apprentice spends three days a week at school and approximately two days a week or the equivalent of 16 hours on site at their job. And then they also take on 150 hours a year of that supplemental training center training. Um, in year two, you can see that the balance shifts so that the apprentice is spending uh, only two days a week at school and the equivalent of three days a week or 24 hours a week on site at their job. Um, the training center time goes up just a little bit to 175 hours a year. And then by the third year, they're nearly full time on site at the job, um, 32 to 40 hours a week uh, at their apprenticeship job. And they're leveraging that experience to really finish up amassing college credit and earning those certifications um, that will allow them you know, maximum value in the job market after their apprenticeship. So after the apprenticeship, after those three years, um, and all of our programs are currently designed on a three year model, um, the apprentice is prepared to move on to their next step. And that could be full-time employment, it could be a continuation of higher education, um, or it could be uh, a combination of both, so part-time working and schooling. Um, and in fact, what's really exciting is even with just a few months of apprenticeship under our belt now, um, some of our more forward-looking companies who are really excited about retaining their apprentices are already exploring options like that third one to try to retain and motivate the talent that they're seeing in their apprentices. Um, but what's important to remember when you, when you look at this slide is that youth apprenticeship, as, as we are envisioning it, is designed to accommodate and advance a wide, wide range of students. So, you know, students with all types of post-secondary plans. It is by no means solely an alternative to college. 
Um, for many students, it will be an alternative through college, one that makes higher education more accessible and affordable. Um, all in all, the benefits accrued by an apprentice expand the options, as I've been talking about, um, available to them at the end of their apprenticeship. Um, and the return that a business gets over the course of the apprenticeship has already allowed it to be a net positive for them. Um, and if they continue to engage in apprentice, or excuse me, with their apprentice by converting them into a full-time employee, we expect them to see further benefits, things like um, increased retention and more loyal, engaged employees, and um, like in Switzerland, potentially increased innovation. So we are so, so excited to have launched our very first cohort last June. Um, in June, we launched in three communities, uh, Metro, Denver, Grand Junction, and Fort Collins. Um, and we uh, placed 116 apprentices um, with 40 companies in those communities. And students came from four school districts and several charter schools. And they will be um, doing that supplemental training at, at eight higher education partners um, who've been selected by our employers um, to supplement the apprenticeship training programs. Um, apprentices are being trained on competencies in 10 uh, specific occupations or, or jobs within, um, within their apprenticeships. So on this slide here, you can see those 10 jobs um, mapped across what we call our pathways. So in our first year, um, we launched in four pathways, and those are the first four you see listed here from left to right, advanced manufacturing, information technology, financial services, and business operations. Um, and this spring, we'll be launching a new uh, occupation, and, and um, we have recruited businesses, and we'll, businesses will be hiring apprentices in our patient care apprenticeship, which is our fifth pathway, um, healthcare. And the idea behind organizing our roles into pathways um, is really to link a group of, of um, high growth, high wage jobs, which is what all of our apprenticeships are geared towards, um, to a common set of college credits and certifications so that we can uh, make sure that we give students those options that I was talking about earlier. Um, so right now, some of our pathways uh, apply across industry and some don't. So for example, if you're a project coordinator, you're earning a, um, oh, I always forget the name of the certification. Uh, uh, associate associate, project, associate manager. project manager credential um, that really would lead to um, options in a variety of industry and fields. Um, whereas if you're in the advanced manufacturing pathway or the healthcare pathway, it's more um, industry and sector specific. So there's a lot of conversation right now about what does a pathway mean <laughs> in this work. And I think we're working our doing our best to help contribute to a productive conversation around that, but it is a little confusing. So as I mentioned, um, in, in 2017, we launched in Denver Metro, in the Denver Metro area, excuse me, in Fort Collins and in Grand Junction or Mesa County. Um, and we are currently in the process of recruiting for our second cohort, um, which will expand to Eagle County. Um, and Eagle County was our first community partner selected through our competitive community application process. Um, and uh, Ashley will tell you a little bit more about that in the coming section. So we're just a few months in, but we're absolutely thrilled to be hearing positive feedback from our employer partners already um, after just a few months of having apprentices on site at their companies. Um, and you can take a look at the slide here and read, read some of the specific quotes, but one of the most exciting themes among um, our survey and focus group responses is it's just the energy and enthusiasm that young people bring to the workplace. Um, and as a result, many of our employers are surprised at how quickly our apprentices are progressing through their training plans. So they're already kind of revisiting um, their thoughts about how long it might take for an, uh, an apprentice to engage in productive work. So we're very excited to be seeing that. And then similarly, apprentices are expressing gratitude for their experiences and really attributing real world value to what they're learning. Um, the quote that I like here on this on this slide is I've learned more in the past five months than I have in the past three years. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's more than that. They're just excited to be engaging in, in real work with real consequences. Um, but one of the more subtle shifts that we're also seeing um, is a real kind of uh, step function leap in maturity um, in the way our apprentices relate to adults. So um, we're consistently hearing back from um, school partners and parents and other folks that are kind of witnessing the apprenticeship program um, that they are just amazed at the maturity and perspective that apprenticeship is, is giving their young people. 
So in 2018, we are beginning our expansion um, and we are um, expanding our business recruitment and our education partnerships accordingly. Um, some of the new business partners that we're bringing on in 2018 include really exciting partners like nationally recognized brands like Otterbox and Vail Resorts, um, but also some partners that obviously reflect our, our expansion into healthcare, um, Vivage and Saba you can see here. Um, and then one of the things that's most tricky in our model is to balance the employer demand for and um, student supply of apprentices in any given geography. So as such, we're, we're working to build out our school partnerships and bring on new districts and schools as needed. So healthcare pathways are our newest pathways. Um, and you know, our expansion into healthcare represents a desire to meet huge need, um, particularly in rural communities. And, and it's kind of a cool opportunity because we believe it both addresses um, health in a really specific way by providing more skilled workforce um, that's able to better care for a community's health, but it also drives that economic opportunity um, that Arden was talking about as she opened the webinar. Um, so, um, we're working out building the options for our pathways now, but this is an exciting advancement as we move into 2018 and beyond. As we look down the road to further expansion, um, we are keeping our eyes on our very ambitious goal of serving 20,000 young people through our youth apprenticeship system by 2026. Um, so this would mean that we're serving about 10% of the state's juniors and seniors um, through our apprenticeship system. And it would also help us move towards sustainability as an organization. So. Um, part of what we do is um, collect business fees from partners who participate and we are just launching that this year so we are experimenting with it um, but we believe that as we scale um, to serve 20,000 young people that means we'll have thousands of businesses in the pipeline um, uh, paying for that service that we provide because they're recognizing the value that they're receiving from it. Um, so that means that in the long run, CareerWise would no longer be dependent on philanthropy, though um, we would very much look to leverage philanthropic dollars for specific initiatives, particularly in smaller, uh, more rural communities and with underserved populations. Um, and uh, you know, if we, get, if we get to that magic point where we reach sustainability and we, if we're scaled across the state, we believe that youth apprenticeship would be a part of our Colorado culture um, and that young people and adults would commonly reference it in conversations you know, ranging from the classroom all the way up to the boardroom. Um, and after that, we'd hope that any community across the nation that has been learning from us, and particularly from Ashley as she <laughs> traipses around the country sharing what we're doing, um, and be able to easily adopt our model um, for better outcomes for their communities and for their young people. Um, so we wanted to just give you a quick taste of um, our apprenticeships and, and give you the chance to hear from some of our apprentices. We have a very short video. CareerWise is bringing together youth and companies and schools to help students end their high school career being in school and being at work. So they're learning what they need to academically, but also learning what they need to professionally. I'm actually doing work here and I'm actually making a contribution to this company, which I think is really cool. It's no longer an either or of you're gonna to go to work or you're gonna to go to college. You can work at the same time, gain industry experience, as well as have a pathway to where you can complete an education. Whatever it is that you think you want to do, this is an opportunity to go try it out. Each student picks a various sector in the market where they have a high level of interest. I just don't think you can get a better opportunity to have that experience and to get some idea of what you might want to do. It's for any young person that really wants to get a head start in the workforce. You should come here and work. It's like you get paid for it, you get experience. It's helped me gain a lot of confidence in myself and what I stand on. People respect me as a person and that I have a job that I'm supposed to do and people will count on me to get that done. This job has prepared me for life after high school an incredible amount. I'm improving on my people skills a lot because I'm having to talk to people a lot, which is something I don't do very often. They chose to have apprentices here, so they want young people here who are eager and willing to learn. They have earned twenty-five dollars to $30,000 of salary over the three years of their apprenticeship. They've earned a credential that tells others in the industry that they are skilled and ready to work. They've earned a year's worth of debt-free college credit that they can take with them. Anyone who has the opportunity to pursue it should. Put yourself out on that limb and take that risk because it's worth the reward. 
I have my own office space. I get to decorate it how I want. It's like an official job and I'm getting paid for it and I'm able to get college credits for it. I don't know why anybody would pass this up. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley. Great, so we're just gonna take 20 to 30 more minutes uh, to continue uh, talking over our model a bit and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, so hopefully after uh, hearing more about our model from Hollis, you're sitting there thinking, you know, how can I get my community involved? This sounds great. You know, I think this could be a great opportunity for students in my community. I think this could be a win-win also for businesses uh, who need access to skilled talent in my community. Uh, so that's what we want to spend a little bit of time talking with you about right now, um, our vision around how we are expanding across the state over the next decade. So I'm actually going to flip back up to the slide that Hollis uh, was talking through before we watched the video, uh, just to um, you know remind you that we are, like Hollis said, working toward building a statewide system that can accommodate 20,000 students or 10% of the state's juniors and seniors in any given year. Uh, but as you can see here on this slide, we are currently in what we're calling a pilot implementation phase. Um, we are really focusing uh, on learning a lot in these early years of the program uh, and will do so until uh, 2021. Uh, so in these first four years of launch, we're really making sure that we're learning everything we can about the work, refining the model before we then really significantly uh, enter that uh, statewide scale phase. Uh, and, and really shop this out uh, far and wide. Now that said, uh, in our pilot implementation phase, we will be expanding you know, uh, slowly uh, to some parts of the state. And so I want to talk with you uh, about what that model looks like uh, and how we're envisioning it working. Uh, so what you see here on this slide is a bit of an overview of what we're calling a local leadership model. Uh, so as part of our local leadership model, as we think about expanding in a statewide fashion, uh, we're really wanting to put local communities in the driver's seat uh, to help develop youth apprenticeship programs in their community that are really attuned uh, to local needs and to the local context. Um, at the same time, CareerWise will, uh, as part of this model, provide a great deal of support, access to all of our tools and materials, uh, training, uh, to help ensure that every community who participates in this model is successful and also to ensure that there's a level of coordination across the state so that there's consistency of, of outcomes uh, for the program and so that employers uh, in one part of the state understand uh, what the value of a youth apprenticeship uh, is, even if it happened in another part of the state, uh, and likewise so that a student could take their career-wise youth apprenticeship uh, and really, uh, um, you know, share that with a, a broad variety of audiences, either employers or higher education, and they would recognize that and understand the value of it. Uh, so as part of our local leadership model, uh, we expect to expand uh, into between one to three and additional uh, new communities for our 2019 to 2020 uh, program year. So like Hollis said, we're currently operating in the Denver metro area, in Fort Collins, in Grand Junction, and we expanded to Eagle County um, as part of this process and as part of this model uh, last year. Uh, we've been working for the last many months and we'll launch youth apprenticeships there in June of 2018. And so we are continuing to build on that work and like I said, expect to expand to between one to three additional communities for the 2019 year. Uh, and we are um, uh, underpinning that process through a community readiness framework and application process, uh, which I'll be talking through here at the end of the presentation, but that process helps communities know what they need to have in place in order to really be ready to support a robust youth apprenticeship model in their community. So as part of our local leadership model, as I've already uh, alluded to, uh, CareerWise would work closely with local communities uh, to really help ensure their success 
Uh, so, you know, for example, as part of this partnership uh, that we will have with communities, we'll provide support with onboarding and, and training of the local leadership who will implement the program. Uh, we'll provide access to our uh, training plans for all of our pathways and occupations that are part of it. We'll offer tools uh, to support career exploration uh, within our K-12 uh, school district partners. We'll provide onboarding tools for employers, onboarding tools uh, for K-12 partners, um, provide all of our materials and brand and student recruiting materials to help the uh, local community uh, implement uh, uh, our uh, you know, recruiting methodologies that we've fine-tuned over the first year and a half uh, so far, and we'll provide access to some of our trainings that we offer to supervisors, for instance, uh, who participate in this model. Um, and of course, uh, this will all come with the benefit of access to a broader network of communities who are uh, increasingly participating in this model. Um, now that said, we will require a lot of our implementing community partners as well. This is certainly a heavy lift. Uh, we're not uh, trying to pretend otherwise. This is a complex system we're building, but I know Hollis and I are so motivated to dig through the complexity and do the hard work just because of the huge potential impact uh, that we know that it will have and that we're already seeing um, in the first few months of, of the youth apprenticeships so far. Uh, so like I said, as part of this local leadership model, we'll really be putting communities in the driver's seat uh, to drive implementation of the work. So CareerWise will provide all of the support I just mentioned. And then on the right side of the page, you can see also uh, that we will expect that uh, the leadership and the individual communities implementing this work will do a lot of the heavy lifting um, around making sure that the program fits uh, in terms of the context and needs of the community uh, and actually implementing it. So like I alluded to or uh, mentioned earlier, we launched a partnership with Eagle County uh, this past year as part of this community readiness and application process that I'll talk through momentarily. Uh, and it's been a great learning opportunity uh, for us to work in partnership with them. And I know that their entire community is so excited uh, to be offering youth apprenticeships there. Uh, so you can see just a few details about what that partnership uh, has looked like in order to help bring to life to you um, what a partnership uh, in your community might look like down the road. Uh, so in July of 2017, Eagle County submitted an application uh, to become a CareerWise community partner. They were selected as a partner in August of last year and will officially be launching youth apprenticeships in June of 2018. And we've spent all of that time since August really working very closely with them uh, to prepare for that launch. So uh, Vail Valley Partnerships uh, is the project uh, lead in Eagle County. Uh, and we're very happy to be working uh, with their director of community development, Eric Williams, uh, who's just brought so much energy and creativity to this work. Uh, and then we have a team member here at CareerWise, uh, Ebony Transu, who really helps support um, on our end, uh, quarterbacking everything that needs to happen uh, on our side of the table and on our team to liaise with all of the partners in Eagle County and make sure everyone's ready for launch. Um, so we're just so thrilled that we have a lot of great founding partners and employers who are participating uh, in the partnership with Eagle County this first year. You can see their logos on this page. Uh, and it looks like they will be launching with 11 apprentices across five employers uh, starting this June. So they are off to a great start. So with that, I'm going to uh, get into the detail uh, around what it takes uh, from our perspective for a community to really be ready uh, to host youth apprenticeships in their community. Uh, and what our you know, application process looks like uh, that is tied to that community readiness framework. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into this you know, to quite the level of detail uh, that I could, but to the extent any of you are interested in going a level deeper um, and applying to become a career-wise partner, um, you know, we can certainly send you additional information uh, or get on the phone with you uh, to describe this in more detail. I should have mentioned um, earlier that 
uh, we are currently coming uh, near to the close of our current application cycle. So we've been working with communities across the state who have reached out to us uh, to express interest in applying. Uh, they will be submitting applications uh, on February 15th of this year, which is the deadline, but will then be opening the next round of applications uh, for the following year, starting in June uh, of this year. So, you know, please stay tuned. If you are interested, it'll only be a couple months uh, until we'll be at June and uh, you can start thinking about applying to become a CareerWise partner for the future. Uh, so as we look at you know, what's required for readiness in any given community, uh, we really think about, uh, about it as a three-legged stool. Uh, so we really believe that first and foremost, the business community uh, must be supportive of this idea and must really see youth apprenticeships as something that can actually address and solve a real workforce development or talent uh, development need that they have because without businesses at the table really buying in uh, and believing this will work uh, we won't have a system that can sustain itself over the long term because it really requires the continual buy-in of businesses uh, who see a return on the investments that they're making in it uh, in order for it to sustain so we ask that communities uh, really do a lot to demonstrate that their business community is interested in bringing youth apprenticeships uh, to the community uh, the second leg of the stool is ensuring that the education community is prepared, understands what's required, and is uh, you know, ready to make the accommodations needed, uh, particularly to help uh, guide students to the right apprenticeships and to make sure that they can be out of school for the time needed to participate in those apprenticeships. Uh, and then finally, and very importantly, uh, the community needs to have real leadership at the table uh, who is driving this forward, be, bringing people to the table, getting people excited, and making sure um, that implementation can happen uh, in a way that can sustain itself over time. So I'm going to go into detail uh, around each of these three elements. Uh, so on the business partner ready, uh, readiness side of things, uh, we ask in our application for communities uh, to, to answer a few key questions uh, related to the readiness of industry in their community. So the first set of questions relates to uh, workforce needs. So we ask communities to evaluate uh, which sectors uh, project economic growth, and workforce needs in the community, uh, which sectors and, and which functions have large numbers of open or unfilled entry-level job postings. Those are really um, indicators around where it might be uh, very useful to focus youth apprenticeships in the community and are an indication, obviously, of what's needed uh, by the business sector in the community. Uh, we then ask communities to identify whether there's any alignment between what those occupational needs are uh, and the current pathways and occupations uh, we support. Uh, we will be expanding our occupations and pathways over time, uh, but as Hollis mentioned during her part of the presentation, we're currently supporting occupations uh, in IT, advanced manufacturing, financial services, business operations, and we're adding healthcare this coming year. We then ask the community uh, to do some work identifying real business leadership uh, in the community and a champion uh, who can really rally engagement and drive collaboration among employers uh, in the community because it requires multiple employers to sit around the table in a sector and agree that youth apprenticeships could be a good thing uh, and that they're willing to host uh, youth apprentices uh, in order to really uh, get to the point where it makes sense for any given community uh, to bring the program there. Uh, and then finally, we ask communities to demonstrate uh, whether there are actual individual businesses uh, who have said, you know, if we're selected as a community partner, you know, yes, sign us up on the dotted line. We're excited and eager to host apprentices, and we ask that those businesses uh, write letters of support indicating uh, that they would love to host youth apprentices in their workplace. So the next set of readiness indicators relate to education partnership readiness. Uh, there's a lot here on this page, and, and this is reflective of the fact that this is a big lift on the part of the education partners who, who work with us. Um, I'll say that we have 
more schools and districts wanting to partner with us than we can uh, accommodate right now. And that's because they, they see the value and they see the opportunity and the impact that this can have for the students that they serve. Um, so our current district partners have been ready and willing to make the very big changes uh, that we will talk through here on this page. Um, so that's been heartening for us and has also helped us understand over the last year and a half what really has to happen um, on the educator partnership side in order to make the model work. Um, so first, we, we look for a history of collaboration between education and industry in a community. You know, if there is any history of collaboration, either through sector partnerships or career exploration, uh, or through the work that workforce centers do, that's a, um, a really strong foundation from which to build and offer a youth apprenticeship program. We also ask uh, whether uh, the community has access to concurrent enrollment dollars and courses that can be used for training purposes. Um, as part of this model, we ask businesses um, to not only pay apprentices uh, a wage, but we ask them to also contribute um, to some of the costs of uh, that training that happens in training centers, as Hollis mentioned. Uh, but the cost of that training is reduced uh, and made workable for employers by uh, the, the wonderful concurrent enrollment system that we have. And so we just want to sense uh, for whether those dollars are available uh, uh, within the district. Uh, we just got a message that our um, internet uh, connection is unstable, so please, uh, someone, you know, let us know uh, if you can't hear us at any point. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end here, though. Uh, so I'll just keep walking down this list. Uh, so uh, we also ask that uh, the uh, district evaluate uh, whether you know, their graduation requirements make room for accelerated credit attainment through competency-based evaluations. Um, this is a great way to open up time and flexibility in a student schedule um, to make sure they have the time needed uh, to spend that, you know, on average, two days a week in the workplace um, as they start their apprenticeship in their junior year. Um, and if they don't use uh, competency-based graduation requirements, are there ways that districts can create um, that flexibility in school scheduling and coursework to ensure that students do have time uh, for apprenticeships? Uh, and then we also ask for communities to identify what partnerships they have um, with local training providers and whether that fits uh, with the, the pathways that they identify um, as having real occupational needs in their community. Uh, we ask uh, whether the districts do enough in the way of career exploration starting at an early age uh, with students to feel good about asking students to make a decision uh, starting in their junior year about pursuing a three-year apprenticeship. Again, that's not to say that students can't do a whole wide range of things coming out of the apprenticeship. They can uh, you know, change jobs and jump into an entirely new sector with a great deal of experience and earnings under their belt. They can go on to um, you know, a two or four year degree and take everything they've learned and some of their coursework with them as well. But we wanna make sure that a student is set up for success and will be as likely as possible to complete the three year apprenticeship. And the best way to do that is by giving them you know, so at least some exposure uh, to different career options before apprenticeships actually start. Uh, and then we ask uh, education partners to identify what their goals might be as far as cohort size, diversity, and whether they understand uh, the commitments involved as part of being a partner. Uh, we've outlined those commitments on this next page. I'm not going to go over this with you now, uh, but when you take a look at these materials uh, later, which will be made available to you, feel free to take a look at these. And then lastly, we ask that the community identify uh, what community leadership and infrastructure they'll put in place to ensure the success and longevity of the program. Uh, so we ask the community to identify a local leader organization who will really take the lead in driving implementation uh, and make available a project lead, an individual um, who will dedicate his or her time uh, to helping make this work. Um, as you might have noticed on the slide, uh, actually I'll just flip back up to that 
um, regarding our uh, work in Eagle Valley. Um, Eric Williams is the project lead, um, the local leader there is Vail Valley Partnerships. And today, Eric has spent about a quarter to a third of his time uh, supporting the preparation for launch. Um, and, and that's for a program on the scale of 11 apprentices with five employers. So that helps give you a sense for how much time is required locally. So we ask each community to identify that leading organization along with a leading individual with that organization uh, and for, for the, both of those to be very clear on what the commitment is uh, as part of this work. We also ask the community to identify whether there are any other local champions uh, who can really play a leading role in advocating for this work, getting people excited about it, getting employers on board, getting parents and students excited. So examples we've seen of those types of local champions are you know, mayors, chambers of commerce leadership, CEOs, legislators, county commissioners. You know, obviously these champions can come in all shapes and forms, uh, but we just ask that the community identify who those might be. Uh, we ask the community to identify whether transportation will be a barrier, uh, and if so, uh, any thoughts you might have uh, about addressing uh, that challenge. And then finally, uh, whether there are any local funders uh, who might be interested uh, in supporting uh, and enhancing this work locally, um, again, with CareerWise's support as well and helping to identify what some of those funding opportunities might be. Uh, the last page here is just that commitment overview uh, that the project lead has to commit to, but I'm not going to go over that now. Uh, and instead, I think it's time to open it up for questions and answers. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, any questions you might have about CareerWise, uh, what is involved in bringing it uh, to a uh, local community that you might have. Uh, as, as you think about how this model uh, might uh, best work uh, in your local context. So thank you so much for uh, listening over the last uh, 55 minutes almost, and we're happy to have the chance to, to open it up at this point. Uh, and, and Arden, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add before we do so. No, thank you so much. I so appreciate that overview. That was fantastic. So I'll read this question off to your That'd be great. Great. So the question is, in more sparsely populated areas of the state, sometimes regional solutions make sense. How would you respond to an application from a region with multiple school districts if they were all well coordinated? Yeah, I, I, I think it would be fantastic uh, to see an application that had an element of regional coordination. We recognize that there are you know, multiple mechanisms through which to do that and that it can only create greater economies of scale uh, to collaborate and come together in a regional fashion. Uh, you know, the, the only caution I, I would uh, say is that we've learned as part of our early experiences uh, that a pilot is always more manageable when starting small and focused. Uh, and so uh, we would just encourage you, even as part of a regional collaboration, to be as focused as possible in the early year or two of the program to learn from that before really then going broad uh, with the work. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, the more regional collaboration, the better. And I think uh, the more sustainable the work will be over the long term. Great, great. Um, there was a follow-up question with this first question, which was also, what would it look like to help youth in isolated rural areas connect with location-neutral opportunities, for instance, with employers based in urban communities? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's something we'd love to hear from you all on. Um, I can't say that I personally know much about uh, that world, but I, you know, we have been told by some of the uh, individuals that we've been in touch with across the state that, you know, virtual opportunities could be, um, you know, something really powerful to look at. So I don't know if anybody on the line, you know, has more thoughts they'd like to share with us about what that might look like an apprenticeship model. But if so, uh, we'd love to hear more. And it looks like you all may be coming online. So maybe that means we can hear you now. So if whoever asked that uh, wants to share more about what you have in mind, we'd love to hear more. Any questions? I'm looking. 
I'll ask a question. This is Tara. Um, I was wondering um, if a community felt like, wow, this is something we'd like to shoot for in a few years, um, and we'd really like to get our ducks in a row. You've done a nice job of laying out what the readiness factors are. If there was, you know, like one place that you would recommend starting for a community that, you know, hadn't really gone here yet, hadn't thought of it too much, you know, they've got, they've got a lot of ambition and hope um, to make their community a better place, and they're looking um, for solutions for their young people. If you were to recommend one place to start, what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, Hollis, feel free to chime in mm -hmm. if you have any thoughts on this. I guess what I, I would say is um, that it's our perspective anyways, that it's incredibly important to start with the business community uh, and to identify whether there are true business needs uh, that can be met through youth apprenticeships there. Uh, you know, we've had experiences in some communities where that hasn't happened first and we've gotten pretty far down the path and then businesses raise their hand and say, actually, you know what, I don't know that this can really meet my needs uh, given where I'm at today. And so making sure that uh, you start first with making sure there is true need and there would be a true demand for this. Uh, if everyone moved heaven and earth to make it possible uh, to get young people in the workplace through these youth apprenticeships, I, I think it's uh, really helpful to start there. Mm -hmm. Great. Hi, I have a question for Arden. Can you hear me? Hi. Arden, this is Andrea down in Salida. Hi. <laughs> and, hi. Um, I was just curious if you know if this conversation is already happening on some level in the business community in Salida or Buena Vista or across the county. Do you know, I do not. Um, primarily, my work right now is in the San Luis Valley. So I'm working in Antonito, San Luis, and Sawatch. So I do not know. I do know that um, in Salida, the um, superintendent of the school district actually started an apprenticeship program with local construction businesses and young people. Okay. Um, yeah, because he's saying 40% of young people may not be going on for a two or four year degree. And so mm -hmm. he just felt like, how do we prepare those young people with, with workforce skills so they can get into right. work? So he's not doing it through career-wise. He's just, just did it. Got it. Yeah, okay. Thank which you. Is great. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a question, and and I know that we've talked about. Um, I noticed that you started in Denver Metro Grand Junction, which is a high concentration of people. Fort Collins, which also does, and Eagle County, which is what I would consider rural resort. I'm curious if you've had applications from more. Um, what I would say isolated rural communities and and what does an application look like in terms of helping to prepare young people for job readiness with local businesses if the community is is very rural have you had that experience yet yeah it's a, a great question and part of why we've been so excited to participate on this webinar and you know start to get input uh, from others on this point because we haven't yet. Uh, so uh, Eagle County to date is the most rural community uh, that we've had the chance to work in, but is obviously a far cry, um, you know, from you know, what you just described as a more isolated rural community might look like. So we're actually undertaking a process right now to have several conversations uh, with thought partners across the state who are helping us think through ways in which we might need to adapt the model uh, to really make it work in those contexts. And we actually do expect to receive you know, one to two applications as part of the application cycle that's closing on the 15th uh, from more rural communities. So it will be interesting to see you know, how they have thought about how to adapt to the model and, and make it work. So all I can say right now, unfortunately, is you know, stay tuned. Uh, we hope to have more thinking on that front over the coming months as we engage in more of these conversations. But that said, you know, we'd love to hear from you all, you know, as you, as you heard about the model, as you thought about it, what challenges, you know, might exist in making this work and how might it need to be tweaked uh, in, in more rural communities. Yeah. I mean, I, I know just from listening to, and I want to let other people chime in. I know just from listening, for instance, one of the communities I'm working in is 500 people. Yeah. Um, so watch. And so, Businesses are, are pretty small. A lot of 
if they are probably mom and pop. And I know that we had conversations about maybe having people do internships with local units of government, like yeah. law enforcement or county government, city government. Um, that, that might be a possibility. Forest service, that might be a possibility as well. Absolutely. I think those are all great fits. And I would say the three themes we've heard so far uh, from some of the people we've talked with about making this work in rural contexts are, you know, first that employers will be naturally a lot smaller. Uh, and I don't see that as a barrier that's insurmountable. Uh, a lot of what we do at CareerWise is provide a backbone of tools and training and onboarding to really make this uh, you know, a less heavy lift for employers who participate. You know, it certainly does make it challenging as a small employer only having, you know, a couple of employees who could, you know, really provide the training to the apprentice. But again, we're here to help. That's our core function and role in the ecosystem is providing that support to employers. The second theme I've heard is transportation. Uh, you know, that a student might have to travel a really long way to get to an employer. And We've certainly seen in these early days uh, that it is hard for students who are spending more than 45 minutes going in any direction uh, to get to work just because they're balancing work, they're balancing school, they're balancing extracurriculars. So when you start adding up and adding in transportation time into the mix, it can be challenging. So that's one we feel like we have to think more about our transportation times and also just transportation period uh, where reliable transportation may not exist for some students. Um, and then the third theme that I've also heard just relates to availability of training uh, for any given occupation uh, for a given sector. Uh, so again, we're doing a lot more to bring online different training partners as we expand across the state, but that requires a careful, you know, uh, meshing of, of partnerships and ensuring the supply demand balance uh, is, is the right fit. And, and so again, I think we'll be a jigsaw puzzle for any given community that we work with. But I would say those are the three themes that we've heard so far that are on our radar. Great, great, fantastic. And that, and I take it if, if one of those, uh, the, a really, really rural community applied in, and is going to be working with you, that communities we're working with could touch base with that community to see what it took to get them to readiness. Definitely. Right. Yes, that, that would be uh, an incredible help. And, you know, we would, as we look to expand to more rural parts of the state, we really will look at it as a true partnership that we're both learning from uh, along the way because we're still new at this and we're still learning. And uh, we're learning a lot, for instance, as we expand into Eagle County as a small step in that direction. Great. Other questions? Oh, oh yeah, my name is Devin Engel, and um, I was just curious about how you chose your initial pathways and what the like process is for adding additional ones. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna talk about it? Um, sure, so at a high level, we look for need. Um, so we're looking for need in industry, so unfilled jobs that take longer to fill, um, and that uh, has able to do with the uh, talking about middle skilled jobs that re do require um, some post secondary training, but not a four year degree, um, and that also lead to um, a career that would be um, you know better than a livable wage essentially. Um, so uh, you know we're not we're not looking to fill jobs; we're looking to start careers for people. Um, so we really want to um, see that it, an opportunity leads to a high growth pathway for that person who participates in it. Um, and then the process for adding pathways, a little we're, more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the process right now of kind of fleshing out, for instance, as we expand into a new community and they surface, you know, hey, this would be a really useful occupation or pathway uh, to bring into the mix. Uh, we're trying to flesh out what a process uh, for vetting that would look like, uh, but we, we do plan each year as we expand um, to at the very least expand to new occupations within our current pathways and then also start considering the addition of entirely new pathways as well over time. So sorry that I don't have a better answer for that yet, but 
No, that's great. I was just like curious about when I saw those, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, I have a little bit more of an ag-based background and yeah. um, students in FFA, um, which was mm -hmm. where I started my career, are required to do supervised work experience as part of their high school curriculum. So okay. I was, so I'm familiar with the pathways that they use for their internship process around Colorado, but um, this is like a whole new set. So it was really interesting to see where you guys had gone with that. Got it. Yeah. Great. I, and I'm looking at in the chat room, there is a, a question um, from Antonito. How would this model work for a small rural community such as Antonito? How would it work? Was that the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if there's any specific dimension of how it would work uh, that you're most interested in. Um, you know, I think this could look a lot of different ways. Um, it would look, you know, very different in sort of a regional collaboration of very small communities, as someone you know, mentioned before, might be a good way uh, to go about this. Uh, for just a, you know, very, very small community applying on their own, I would envision that that community would start by identifying, you know, one to two anchor businesses who would be really interested uh, in hosting apprentices, see this as a valuable way to develop talent and also create a pathway for students to stay and live and work in their community uh, if they want to do so. And then uh, you know, if there is that real workforce need, then having conversations with the school district to identify, you know, can we get creative here? Is there a way to make sure that students can spend you know, two days a week in the workplace doing that uh, really meaningful, productive work uh, that leads to all of these great outcomes we've described? Um, you know, so Arden, as you mentioned, uh, it could be that there are opportunities for apprenticeships uh, in public offices, uh, that business operations and project coordinator role uh, is potentially a great fit there. Um, and then depending on what the specific industry footprint of the community looks like, there might be ways uh, to make uh, some of our other pathways fit. For instance, we do have this financial services pathway. So if there's uh, you know, a bank in town uh, there could be an opportunity for someone to step either into a financial services role uh, within that bank. There's, you know, IT as well and supporting the IT needs of small businesses, um, you know, or again, that sort of business operations role can be relevant in a wide variety of, of settings. Um, and then I think, you know, there are other opportunities for the broader community to get involved. So we ask that businesses assign apprentices with a supervisor. Um, who supervises their work over the course of the three-year apprenticeship. We also ask that businesses assign the apprentice a coach who's sort of their mentor. Uh, you know, we've heard from some of the communities interested in, in applying that there are businesses small enough interested in participating that they can't afford to assign the apprentice with both a supervisor and a coach. So in those cases, you could imagine that volunteer organizations in the community uh, might be interested in providing a coach to play that role to the apprentice uh, who's uh, participating in the experience. So I think there are a lot of ways to get really creative uh, to make this work in a smaller community. And we're just now starting to hear thoughts and input in that regard. Uh, but I think there's you know, still a lot more left to learn and, and think about together. Great. What other questions are out there? This is Tara. I'll jump in and ask another question if nobody else has one. Um, so we heard a um, webinar yesterday um, that was um, where somebody from um, CSU was talking about the viability of entrepreneurship in small, um, especially rural communities and how entrepreneurship is a real um, opportunity that community shouldn't overlook um, and looking for ways to promote that. Can you imagine any, I, I loved what you were saying about maybe recruiting volunteers to serve as mentors. Would that be like kind of a, too much of a stretch for your model to think about ways that um, to promote entrepreneurship or to connect young people um, with people who could help teach them entrepreneurial skills? What do you think about that? 
I think it's a great question and great idea and something that we've been batting around internally as well uh, in, our, in the earliest phases of thinking about and testing uh, with uh, individuals like yourself. So, you know, don't hold me to this. This is very much in the ideation phase, but, you know, we have been thinking about what, uh, for instance, a small business management and entrepreneurship path could look like. Uh, so basically giving uh, students the opportunity to work in small businesses or maybe family businesses uh, and lead them through a training program that helps at the end of that, position them to run a small business, but in the process will bring in enough in the way of entrepreneurial training that it could also position them very well to understand what it takes to then launch and run a, you know, a business themselves. Uh, so that's just one idea that we have in the mix. I'm sure there are lots of different ways to bring entrepreneurship into the mix, but that's the idea that we're sort of kicking around right now and, and trying to get some feedback on. Does that resonate with you, Tara? Yeah, thank you. I, I definitely think that people in, in small rural communities have to be very innovative um, and enterprising when it comes to making a living. And so I, I think there's actually probably a lot of skill sets um, that could be tapped into there in small communities. That's great to hear. That's awesome. I have a question about the training piece. So um, I recall that you were explaining that the student still attends their current high school and they do the internship, but there's an additional training piece is that, um, and I may have missed what some of what you said there, but is that in mostly through community college or is that through an additional program at their high school or some sort of online program or how does that work? Um, the provider can be any one of those institutions. So in some cases it's, um, a, it's a, a teacher in a CTE classroom. Oh. Um, that is, uh, in many cases, an adjunct professor at a community college, um, or it could be actually at a community college, um, or it could be at a four-year institution. Our current providers, um, I believe, are all community colleges mm -hmm. um, in, in that case. And CSU Global. Oh, and well. CSU Global as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So I, I just want to say a big thank you to both of you. This has been um, really, really helpful, really insightful. Um, has given, I'm sure, the communities a lot to think about. I know it's given me a lot to think about. And I want to thank the communities yeah. for taking time out of your valuable, valuable days um, to be on this. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate the opportunity uh, to share the model with you all and, and get your input and hear your ideas. Thanks for taking the time. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And if nobody has other questions, um, I have a wonderful day and look forward to, to seeing you soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Goodbye.